a very warm welcome from our side here from Schlotauer and Wauer to a new webcast. We are really happy that you joined us today. We're right now at the introduction. Um, so next step will be Ines concept and algorithms that will take like a bit more than half of, of my presentation. Um, yeah, to repeat what Ines does, how, how does it do it and also um, to introduce those of you uh, who haven't heard of it yet um, to the algorithms. Then uh, we have a chapter that I called Scaling Enes, where we're going to talk about the project that we did for the city of Bogota, where we um, introduced Enes um, for the whole city or parts of the city. We'll come to that later. And then um, we're going to give a short outlook about um, an update of the Enes um, algorithms, um, the new ev evaluation of coordinated corridors, um, just um, a few words on that. And then we'll have the chance to do some questions and answers. So let's get started. Context, um, what is Enes? What does it do um, as our other um, as our other software products from Schlotau and Wauer, Anna, Lisa, Enes? They work in as a complementary tool with the traffic, traffic central computer. So we're not here to um, yeah, uh, to, to, to build a new traffic central. We're communicating with the traffic central using the data that the traffic central can provide and um, giving back information, giving back recommendations about what should be the strategy or what program should be, um, should be selected um, at any given uh, point in time. Um, so allow me some Philosoph philosophical, uh, like very basic um, animations here. So what we will usually see, we have a flow in the morning peak, like the most basic of our uh, use cases um, and uh, an evening peak in the afternoon or in the evening weather where the um, traffic is leaving the city again. So uh, very basic patterns. Um, of course, the network control should be able to do more than that, but this is like the, the, the most basic way to explain it. Um, and um, when deciding um, what strategy, what green times, what signalizations um, would be best suited for um, the current situation, we're running into, uh, let's say, the, the very basic problem that the more capacity um, we're sending um, to the traffic lights on the street. We're also creating more waiting time at the same point. Um, as soon as you have enough capacity, at least, um, and and you can handle uh, the volumes at hand or the volumes present on the street, as soon as you send more capacity than actually needed, you will always increase waiting time. So our goal is that we will have to find the optimum between um, the needed capacity and um, uh, for this capacity, the minimum waiting time. Um, so our approach is that there is a set of plans already existed in the uh, in the local controllers, being planned by um, by a traffic engineer, being planned by someone who knows the area. And from this given set of plans, of scenarios, of strategies, um, our network control chooses in its very basic algorithm. On top of that. We can also change uh, green times uh, within a given plan, but we come to that later. So um, why are we using this approach? Why don't we just change everything uh, and uh, I don't know, put our own controllers and our own control method uh, from top to bottom? So because the situation that we usually um, presented with when we come when we look at a new city or a new customer is that um, we have controllers that are typically connected to a traffic central. The central is sending uh, signal timing plans or the command to switch to a certain signal timing plan. And then when you look at what is actually installed in the streets, we have a potentially mixed bag of manufacturers and protocols. So um, 
there might not be one type of controller installed, but different times from different generations with different plannings, some of them fixed time, some of them traffic actuated. And uh, there's a fair amount of sunken cost in those installations and also knowledge and uh, expertise in the plannings. So the question is, do you want to throw all of that away or maybe um, use what is already installed in coordinations and plans and so on whatsoever and include them in your scenarios. Whereas, yeah, I said it, a different method would be and one that we, um, yeah, that is, let's say a different approach. We don't have to say that it's worse or better. Um, would be using some kind of black box algorithm um where you have this very comprehensive model like the central is doing all the all the decisions for you from a central point of view usually um this comes with the need of a large amount of input data um it uh, needs to be maintained it's usually uh harder to calibrate it needs more expertise um and it needs expertise in the whole control process that you implement and uh, what what when we listen to the feedback that we got of customers who have experience with these kind of uh, network controls is that it, it's usually never really working for an extended amount of time without major problems so um, what is it that people actually have experience with that is still in use because they know how it works? These are these threshold system where you have traffic actuated decisions based on um, certain thresholds. Let's say uh, I have 150 vehicles on this intersection, so I switch up 200 here, I would switch up or 15 there, I would switch up. Um, then I need a number to switch down. This is still like very, this is very, uh, yeah, accessible, it's easy to understand, but it also comes with a downside because the more the more programs you introduce, the more parameters you need. Um, you need parameters for switching up, down, sideways, whatever you want to call it, and not only for that one, but for all of these um, intersections that you have. So um, our goal was to actually develop something that um, is as understandable and um, and straightforward as this, but with a lesser amount of parameters. Um, yeah, I already mentioned it, how the system actually works. So we're working with the traffic central as an uh, as a system that is communicating with it, taking current program, detective values, green times, and maybe AP values, and sending switch commands and control parameters back to the traffic central and the traffic central is handling all the information uh, uh, or process data and handling with the uh, local controls. So um, as I mentioned, we want to boil down these this large number of parameters. How do we do that? We do that by um, not looking at actual volumes or green times or whatever. We look at saturation. We look at the ratio between needed green and actual green and that we call saturation uh, you could also call it flow ratio um, or something uh, in that direction but the the basic idea behind our calculations is that you have some percentage of of, of uh, yeah saturation or flow ratio and that is the value that we're looking at so keep that in mind we're going to get into it a little bit more detail now, um, so these are the INIS modules, so to say, the the modules of its decision making algorithm. Um, we have two main layers. One of the so-called scenario selection that is the algorithm that is, as I said, uh, picking the right scenario of a given set of plans. So let's say you have maybe. Um, a 60 second cycle time, a 75 second cycle time, a 90 second cycle time, so and and different plans within these cycle times and, and the scenario selection algorithm will tell you which one to pick out of this set of given plans. 
and it starts that in three steps, um, which we will uh, discuss a bit more in detail. First of all, looking at the saturation, which I just said. So this is the main um, the main benchmark um, for this decision making. If saturation is uh, inconclusive or if it's the same for two programs, which maybe just have a different coordination, we look at the loss time. So uh, basically having a look at what direction is predominant here or um, which um, yeah, which coordination favors which direction and, and which do we have. And then strategics. Um, after doing all the math, we also take a look at the density at the maybe congestion, something that we actually measure in the street um, on top of that. So maybe um, the numbers are telling us that everything should work fine. Uh, there's not enough. There is there are not enough cars actually to to use all the green time that we're sending. But we see that this has actually to do with uh, congestion, with uh, with speeds going down. So that is the strategic level lever, uh, layer that comes on top of it. Um, but at that point in our algorithm, we will put in the notion that there were actually two seconds more available. They were just not realized. The control didn't give it to this to this approach because it didn't need it. But still, there was there would have been eight seconds, uh, and this is what we call the guaranteed green. So uh, we're basing our calculations on that, and that is why we can make decisions as well for traffic actuated as also for for fixed time um, with this approach. So now we have this saturation settled. The question is, um, can we um, make a decision based on that? Um, and the answer is not yet, because just knowing if the saturation is high or low doesn't really give us um, something to decide upon, because high saturation can be not can be good. Uh, High saturation can be a bad thing. If we are in a uh, at night time, we want to pick the scenario with the highest saturation because we don't want to send a long cycle time. If we are at any maybe at another point of the day, we want a low saturation because we, uh, we want it. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't want to be on the limit of it. So we need an evaluation method that favors an optimal range of saturations, and we want to specify that for every program. And we also want to specify for every program what is this maximum saturation. And that is why we take the saturation that we have measured and we put it into our utility function. So we'll put it here now on the x-axis. And now you see that this. Uh, we have this utility graph that looks like that for for all the programs. And here we can specify which part of the saturations do we actually deem as optimal and which part of the situation do we deem as oversaturated? And then we that leads to these. Um, yeah, to our results and uh, this utility basically is a score for every program that tells us is it good now at the given situation or not? Um, here is a, an example. Uh, what would happen with the same um, number of vehicles per hour compared between a low capacity plan and a high capacity plan. First of all, these this number of vehicles would lead to maybe 50% capacity or saturation in in a low capacity plan, which would mean 100% utility, and in a high capacity plan would be 30%, um, which would lead to about 50% utility. So in this case, we would favor this plan because it's better suited, although the, the saturation is higher. So that is how this basic principle works. We don't only do that for one um, signal group, but for all of the signal groups and for all of the programs and uh, or at least all relevant signal groups. And what we end up with is this utility graph which is giving us a score. Which of the programs is best suited right now uh, based on its screen times? 
as you can see here, some of them are pretty close to one another during certain periods of the day. So we will probably need a second layer of decision making there. And this is where the loss time comes into play. And um, I'm going to explain now how we do this loss time calculation now. And this is the point that I mentioned at the beginning. This is something where we uh, have are currently improving our uh, decision making algorithm, which I will uh, show at the end how it will work and why we think that it will make our decisions better. So right now to find out the lost time. What we do is we define certain corridors in our um, control network and say, OK, this is a coordination that I'm interested in where I want to make sure that we're always um, choosing um, the right program for that uh, specific direction. And what we do is we run a little simulation in the background where we run the cars through the um, through the coordination and we are summing up the loss time that uh, we expect them to have. And we do that for both directions, of course. And as you can see here, um, in this particular part, it's a very, yeah, not very favorable for this direction. So we would see much more loss time for that direction. And um, yeah, we're not only doing that for one car, but for several cars or for the volume that we are measuring right now. And then we get um, a loss time value um, for every scenario. So we can rate them based on that. So these are the first two steps, saturation, just looking at the green times, loss time, also looking at the coordination. Now strategics, what is that? As I said, we are looking at the combination of speed and volume. And um, this, for example, is a plot of the combination of speed, which is on the X axis, the Y axis, and on the X axis, we have the, the volumes and um, yeah, what you sometimes see is that the that these dots are uh, coming down here. So there are sometimes situations where you have low speeds with the same volume like up here. So the combination of these two values gives us an idea if we have congestion or not. And um, these strategic detectors are placed within the project phase at places where we expect um, congestion to happen. So these were the three steps for scenario selection. Then we have the green time redistribution um, as an optional second layer. Um, how it works in our control philosophy is that actually the local controller is deciding on a second to second basis which stage to activate, how long to extend the stage, um, what is the maximum green time and so on. Um, the guideline for that or what the maximum green times can be, this is decided by um, by certain uh, permission periods that are parameterized in the local controller and the network control, the adaptive part of the network control can change these permission per per periods um, on a five minute basis. So um, if the um, green time is ending in second 26 or 27, 28, this is always the decision of the controller, but Ines can say, OK, but the latest possible point can be second 30 if there's someone in the other direction or the latest point for this direction would be 47 stuff like that. So let's say the the decision making is in the local controller. The guidelines for the for the decision making um, are coming um, from the um, uh, are coming from the network control. Then also part of this step would be the offset change. In our current implementation, this offset change is a direct function of these, the changes um, of the permission periods, um, meaning that if we are changing the permission period in a way that the green time will extend significantly, we will also change the offset um, in such a way that some of it 
is given as um, in, in the beginning of green and not everything at the end. But this is not really an offset optimization. It's more a direct function of the green time redistribution algorithm. Uh, but we will see that with our new approach that we're implementing currently, we will also be able to find um, an optimized uh, coordination based on the current uh, based on the current um, current volumes. So, yeah, this was a very fast uh, walk through um, of these algorithms of the um, functionality uh, or of the control philosophy. Um, I would now like to go to our or talk about our um, Bogota project um, and talk a little bit about the changes that we've made or the um, yeah the steps forward with the software that we had to take to make this uh, project happen and why we had to do them. Um, yeah, I've called it scaling Enes, city of Bogota, and scaling is exactly the, yeah, let's say the the, the main uh, topic here that I want to talk about. Um, we had to find ways to make the workflows in Enes uh, easier to use with larger networks easier to um, adapt to changes and uh, yeah make all our tools a bit more streamlined in a way that we could handle this huge project which was uh, all in all bigger than all the intersections we had worked on uh, prior to this project so as you can see um, we were tasked given the task to um, carry out a traffic study for these 1500 intersections of the city of Bogota. These are all the traffic lights the city has. Um, you might wonder from, an Europe, from a European perspective, it doesn't sound a lot for a city that size. Bogota is about 9 million, between 7 and 9 million inhabitants, depending on how you count. Um, they have uh, we were ending up with 58 different Ines networks, um, independent networks controlled by Ines. You can see the zones here marked in yellow. So each of them is marking one Ines zone. Some of them are like urban areas or uh, central areas with with dense networks. Some of them coordinated corridors, um, some short, some very long, um, and some a mixture of both. Um, all in all, 1300 video detectors, uh, and the the biggest task here was to actually decide um, what depth of Ines control is really necessary in what part of the city. So we even we identified parts of the city where we didn't implement the network control at all because we saw traffic was very stable there. There was no need um, to to uh, yeah to use cameras because we're actually limited in the use of detection. So we put the detection there where, where our um, analysis found that they were actually changing traffic patterns, dynamic traffic patterns, where there was really a difference between, uh, let's say, Monday and Wednesday. And uh, those areas where we found that traffic patterns were A, not changing a lot, or B, never critical. Um, there we didn't implement um, the the network control. So what we ended up altogether were 800 controllers connected to Enis. Um, about 350 of them with green time redistribution, 90 with green corridor. That it, this green corridor solution also popped up in some of the slides. I was not explaining it here any further. It's a very specific solution for. Uh, for Bogota. So 350 with green time redistribution, fully adaptive, so to say. 500, including those 350, um, with uh, traffic actuated uh, plan selection or scenario selection, as we call it. And um, another 300, which are also, which also form part of the networks that these 500 controllers are in, but which don't have their own detection. So they are um, 
connected to the others in the network in a way. Um, they are not as critical so that it would justify to put a camera there, but they are coordinated in such a way that they are always, um, yeah, that they always share the same cycle time and will always change program when these other 500 change program. So all in all, 800 controllers. And um, the problem that we had up to this point or the thing that made our workflow uh, problematic for this large implementation was that um, before we had a city network with the Innes, um, with the Innes, oh, the question was, what do you mean by based on own information? Uh, based on own detection. So they have their own detection. Um, let's say these 500, inter all these 500 intersections have, have detection, have cameras. Um, and these 306 um, don't have have cameras, but we are deducting the the flows or calculating the flows based on neighboring intersections which do have. Workflow in Enos 1.x, so to say, was that um, we had to provide intersection configuration or get the intersection configuration data somehow, I don't know, exported, printed out, um, somehow read out of the database of whatever city network we were working with and then do a zone creation configuration and changes and so on uh, within the uh, within an external tool then get this data back into the city network configure the the inner server that is within that network and then do the calibration on it um, this wouldn't have been practical um, for this large number of intersections. So we formed a few requirements or we formulated a few requirements before we went on with the Bogota project. First of all, we needed future, future proof web technology. That was also an issue. We were still running on Flash at that point. Um, streamlined configuration process that can handle changes also on a daily basis. Um, better support for calibration without the need for external tools. The calibration itself was done on the machine, but um, we didn't have all the reports necessary to get the information without yeah, crunching numbers in Excel. Integration of automated KPI reports to document improvements. So um, we integrated where possible um, some, some automated uh, yeah, uh, comparison between lost time uh, with and without uh, our decisions. Persistent data storage across configuration changes. So in the past, we had some database issues whenever we changed the configuration and unified installation benefits of all future updates. So also in the past for every city, there was a unique uh, installation project or uh, yeah, uh, a unique release of Enos and we now have one unified version that uh, is always the same with the same uh, standard algorithm and with the same standard parameters. So how does the workflow look now? So we have a direct intersection import to the inner server. On this inner server you can create, configure, calibrate and change um, these networks. Um, Usually creation and configuration is still done by ourselves via a remote access, but it is still it is done in the same tool and is um, accessible also for our custom clients if they want to have a look at it. So what are the results of this Bogota project? Not only for our workflow, but for the traffic on the street. Um, Travel time improvements on adaptive corridors. These are actual actual journey time measurements. So um, for morning, afternoon, and for the average. Um, so um, we were comparing both directions. So you see that we're not. You do not always see an improvement in for every case, which is I think kind of logical because. Uh, um, one direction 
cannot get better in the morning and in the evening. Uh, I mean, not necessarily. Of course, the programs were also revised, but uh, um, yeah. Somewhere we have very, very high improvements. Somewhere we have slight losses uh, in travel time, um, but in on average, we were improving travel times about 10% um, compared to the um, state before. I don't want to blame everything on the network control. I mean, there was also some uh, some planning done and, and replanning of local control. So um, yeah, uh, never trust people who tell you that the network control will give you 15% um, travel time improvement. And some probably other factors like ourselves, like here for us. Um, lost time improvements, uh, as I said, this graph, this is actual journey time measurement. Somebody uh, taking a car with a stopwatch. This one here, lost time improvement. This is something that we calculate internally. This is the um, outcome of this KPI report that I talked about uh, earlier. So the algorithm by itself is comparing what the um, what the schedule, the scheduled plan at a certain time of day would have decided compared to what we decided, what Ines decided at a certain time of day and comparing uh, the lost times that are calculated in in this uh, in this coordination uh, um, algorithm that I showed you before that is simulating the cars in the background. So this is not an ex actual measurement. This is a calculation. Um, so of course it's going to be better. This is what we are basing our decisions on. Um, but what is interesting, I think, to see, uh, so you see Bogota here, and uh, the center is actually these um, these districts nine, eight, and seven, because Bogota is kind of limited by a by a mountain range on this side. So you won't find any any people living on this side of the center, and uh, and everyone else is living here to the west um, of the center. And you see that uh, talking about lost time, talking about quality of coordination, you are not going to see that much of an improvement in the actual center because there you never have these stark uh, differences in in traffic flow. So um, taking one coordination or the other, they will all favor basically both directions. But on the outskirts, um, those where you have these, uh, yeah, arterias, so to say, these, uh, these, uh, yeah, these connections into the city. That is where the where the biggest improvements are lying. Yeah, so that was my little uh, uh, my little summary of the the Bogota uh, project. Uh, we uh, had to make improvements to our software. We had to improve it in the ways that it was more capable of handling large number of, of intersections, big bigger data, uh, also more changes in the data, easier configuration. And uh, we don't only achieved that, we also achieved some improvement in travel times and lost time. So um, I think a very, very positive outcome there. Um, one more point before we come to Q&A. Um, I mentioned before when I talked about lost time and uh, lost time calculation that we are only looking at, looking at certain corridors. And uh, it is a tool that um, is working good enough until now to decide whether or not take favor one coordination over the other, but it's not precise enough to also use it as a base for um, offset optimization. So right now, what we are planning to do and where we're already pretty far um, in the process is including the evaluation method that is already a module in LISA that has been introduced with Lisa 7.3, um, which is a um, much more sophisticated way of evaluating coordinated corridors that takes into account platoons, that takes into account density of traffic within these platoons, 
um, that also takes into account vehicles that turn into and out of this corridor. And that is um, also tracking tailbacks. So when you um, look at this screen here, it's a screenshot that I took from Lisa. Um, this is a time distance diagram of a coordinated corridor, and uh, you might be used to these green um, areas in the past. It was usually just indicating that there is a, yeah, that you could get from intersection one to intersection six without stopping. So now what we see here, these different shades of green, they are indicating different densities of traffic. And let me go to the next slide so you understand better. So what we're having here, um, we're basically having two parts of the green time, one before the in the first nine seconds of the green time and then in the last 18 seconds of the green time. In both of these time periods, we have the same amount of vehicles per hour, 300 vehicles here, 300 vehicles there, but here they're coming with a shorter gap between one another. So this is like the maximum density that you could achieve, 1.8 seconds for every vehicle, leading to a density of vehicles per kilometer of 40 vehicles. If you're interested in the formula, you'll find it down here. Um, I think the main part to take away here is in the first nine seconds of the green, cars are passing through with maximum density, a car every 1.8 seconds. Down here, it's much more relaxed, one car every 3.6 seconds, so half the density. And the same is seen when we go back again in this, in this uh, graph here. So when you look at the first intersection, you have cars coming at maximum density in the first seconds of green. That is because we're, we're assuming they're uniformly arriving here and uh, now we're showing the density of the platoon. What is interesting about it and what makes it more handy to actually look at, at waiting times and so on, uh, we're also seeing that the density is getting lighter here over the course of the coordination, at least up until this point. And that is because some cars are turning out of the uh, coordination. They're leaving the coordination. That's why there are less cars here in the middle. And then you see that the density is going up again to the end. And this is due to cars that come from secondary directions. These are these other shapes down here, which represent platoons coming from the outside. And also here, for example, in red, you see that they're waiting and you also see that they're blocking some of the cars coming from uh, from the first intersection. And here you have this effect, yeah, pretty stark, like a lot of cars coming from the outside, waiting here and blo blocking this part of the platoon and leading to a much higher density in the end. Um, so the waiting times that you're getting from this are more accurate, they are more comprehensive. They take into account the whole situation, all the flows that we're measuring here. Um, and because of that, they can be taken as a basis for an optimization process. If we're just looking at two directions, um, it's giving us a good idea of what, uh, what we're interested in and what is better or not, but we wouldn't use it as basis for an optimization process because we might make the secondary direction so so bad that it doesn't really make sense. So yeah, uh, where we are right now with this, if we we have already put it into its own package, um, it can be integrated into Enos and Enos can ask this piece of software, hey, tell me the, the waiting time based on your simulation and your better model and not just based on my little car simulation that I've shown you earlier before when we talked about the last time. This is part one. We are, um, we hope that the, um, um, that the evaluation will become more precise and it will be easier for the, um, for the algorithm to decide which, um, which direction is better suited for a certain situation or which scenarios better suited. And the second will be the um, optimization 
Um, and for the optimization, uh, yeah, I put this uh, this picture here of of a hilltop um, uh, in to explain how our optimizing uh, algorithm works. The problem that we have when we are, want to optimize offsets um, when you have a bigger number of intersections and you have a large num also a high number of uh, a higher cycle time um, we are talking about optimizations that have to take part in seconds right or uh, maybe within uh, 30 seconds a minute five minutes the maximum um, with seven or eight intersections if you want to calculate all the possible outcomes and all the possible solutions uh, and even if you're optimistic and you think that it might you might be able to calculate like a thousand solutions per second um, we are also already talking about two to five years of computation com computing time uh, for eight intersections so we need something that is faster the problem is that yeah, with every intersection, the it is an exponential problem, and it gets bigger and bigger, and it cannot be um, it cannot be solved in time uh, to find an optimal solution. And um, what we're doing here is we're implementing an algorithm that can find a local optimum that can search in the vicinity of a solution and find something that is at least better than its neighbors. Um, I'd like to, when you think about the problem, you want to find the highest, um, the highest mountain in the world, but everything is uh, foggy. You cannot see further than, uh, than, than two meters. So you cannot decide if you're on the highest mountaintop, even if you could see all of them at any given point. So all you can do is you can measure how high you are, that is allowed. Uh, because we can also measure how good our coordination is. We can measure the waiting time and you can um, you can figure out in which direction to go to go uphill because there are mathematical. Um, there are some mathematical methods to decide that we can look at one. Um, we can look at two different solutions at two different. Um, uh, two different coordinations and say in which direction we will probably find a better one if we change one of the intersections. Um, so when we go back to the to this uh, to this example, you want to find the highest mountain uh, in the world. Uh, if you always go uphill, at some point you will be on a hilltop or on a mountain top. You don't know yet if it's the Mount Everest, but it could be the Mount Everest. And um, the way to raise the pos pos possibility that it is the Mount Everest, you just try more and more often. And uh, if you try often enough, then the possibility that the Mount Everest will be one of your solution gets at least high enough um, to be satisfied with it. So that's what we're basically doing um, here. So and that will give us the opportunity at some point to also optimize offsets and say we integrate this proven tool that we use in Lisa and uh, and put it into Enis. That is basically my presentation. To sum it up, um, when we developed Enis, we wanted to make it transparent. We wanted to be understandable. We wanted to keep our um, algorithms um straightforward and easy to understand we wanted to make it effective make the calibration easy and uh hand being able to handle it uh, even for larger cities and larger networks we want to make it modular we don't want to use uh i don't know we don't, don't always have to use all the tools to make an improvement maybe sometimes some tools are um are more suited, sometimes not. Um, so if you just want to do scenario selection, just do scenario selection. If you want to go fully adaptive and change green times, you can also do that, but you can always choose. Does it make sense here? Um, is it maybe not 
not necessary because there is no green time to redistribute. We are always on over the top anyway, so I just wanted to change to the right plan at the right time of day. Uh, and it should be, yeah, expandable uh, or to put it differently, um, extensible or scalable, so to say. And um, and yeah, at Slow Tower we still want still want to keep it open and um, vendor uh, yeah vendor agnostic, so to say, open interfaces, so you can use your existing infrastructure. Um, that's it with the presentation. Uh, I hope there was some there was some new information for you um, in it. And if you have any questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat or raise your hand and uh, ask them. Would the improvements be available? So what is the timeline for ENES 2.0? Um, so ENES 2.0, the stuff I mentioned about the workflow and so on, uh, they are already um, available. The improvements of the uh, evaluation are uh, currently under development and um, yeah, we, hard to say. Um, I would say until the end of the year, um, but um, the way I see it, it will probably be uh, an update that will be um, available um, also for existing customers, at least to some extent. Maybe not the optimization, but at least uh, the changes to the to the uh, lost time evaluation itself. But that is not, don't quote me on that, it's not decided yet. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's... the bleeding edge of development right now. Yeah, and it's a very complex topic, so we would, like to be sure that it is really reliable what we do there. Yeah, I'm not so much. I'm not worrying so much about that. It's like it's just um, we might have to think about different ways to um, to display what is happening in the background. Um, but I think a very basic version is is it's already uh, rather close. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And as always, we are at your service if you have further questions. Please contact us at service at schlotower.de if you have any technical questions or if you want to quote an offer, have uh, any sales related questions, then please contact us at lisa at schlotower.de. Thanks and have a nice day.